Good morning and welcome to the public meeting of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. This meeting, CPSC staff will brief the commission on a draft notice of proposed rulemaking that would, for the first time, establish safety standards for infant support cushions. From 2010 to 22, we know of at least 79 deaths and an additional 125 incidents with these products. This proposal will establish a safety standard for infant support cushions, as durable nursery products to fulfill our obligations under Section 104 of the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act. In a moment, I'll turn this over to staff so they can brief us. Once they've completed the briefing, each commissioner will have 10 minutes to ask questions with multiple rounds if necessary. As a reminder, if you have any questions that address statutory interpretation or legal advice, please don't ask them at this time. We can hold a closed executive session at the end of the briefing upon request. Briefing us today are Dr. Stephanie Marquez, uh, Project Manager and Supervisory Scientist, Division of Health Services Pharmacological and physiology within the Office of Hazard Identification and Reduction. That's quite a mouthful. And uh, Ms. Elizabeth Layton, Attorney, Office of General Counsel. Sorry that you don't have a longer title. Um, I will now turn the microphone over to Dr. Marquez and Ms. Layton. Thank you. Um, thank you, and good morning, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. I'm Stephanie Marquis, the project manager for the Infant Support Cushion Rulemaking Project. As the chair mentioned, today Elizabeth and I will discuss the ASH rough proposed rule for infant support cushions. Oh, um, I guess next slide, please. Today's presentation will begin with opening statements from Elizabeth on the underlying statutory framework for this rulemaking. Then I will provide an overview of the product and the other background information. There's some. Can you? Can you try again. Then I will provide an overview. I think it's working. Yes. Uh, the product and other background information. Review incident data and hazards associated with infant support cushions. Discuss information relevant to the development of the staff proposed rule. Describe staff's proposed rule and the potential small business impact of the proposed rule. And finally, present staff's draft recommendations. Now I will turn over to Elizabeth, who will provide the statutory overview for this rulemaking activity. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. Um, under Section 104B of the Consumer Product Safety Improvement. Oh, I'm sorry, Elizabeth. Next slide, please. Oh, next slide, please. I apologize. Thank you. Uh, under Section 104B of the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act, the Commission is required to issue consumer product safety standards for durable infant or toddler products using the notice and comment procedure in the Administrative Procedure Act. Section 104B2 of the CPSIA requires the Commission to promulgate standards for durable infant or toddler products until it has done so for all such product categories. As the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals has affirmed in the Finbin decision, the Commission not only has the authority to regulate durable infant or toddler products for which no voluntary standard exists, it is required to do so by Section 104B2's express statutory command to regulate all categories of durable infant or toddler products. Next slide, please. Because there is no existing voluntary standard addressing the suffocation and asphyxiation hazards associated with infant support cushions, the Commission is not required to develop a rule with reference to an existing voluntary standard. Per the requirements of the APA, the draft notice of proposed rulemaking initiates a notice and comment process for developing a rule. Thank you. And now I will turn it back to Stephanie. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, this project really, uh, next slide, please. Uh, this project really began as examination of the infant pillow ban. In 1992, pursuant to the commission's authority under the Federal Hazardous Substances Act, the FHSA, the commission banned infant cushions and infant pillows that had all the following characteristics. Has a flexible fabric covering. Is loosely filled with granule material and is easily flattened. Is capable of conforming to the body or face of an infant. 
and it's intended or promoted for the use by children under one year of age. The ban was intended to address a specific type of product, an infant beanbag cushion that was popular in the 80s and was used as a mattress during a time when the recommended sleep position for infants was face down prone. Next slide, please. Over the years since the ban, there have been significant increases in products promoted as infant support cushions that do not fall under the scope of the infant pillow ban, particularly due to the use of the non granular fill materials. As staff becomes concerned about and staff has become concerned about potential suffocation hazards, these products present to infants. The draft proposed rule would apply to any infant product that is marketed, designed, or intended to support an infant's weight or any portion of an infant while reclining or in a supine, prone, or recumbent position. All the products shown in this slide would fall under the scope of the proposed rule. And as you can see, there are a variety of products that fall under the scope of the proposed rule. Next slide, please. Along with the significant increase in products in recent years, there has also been an increase in deaths associated with infant support cushions, which has been a great concern of staff. Next slide, please. Staff search of the Consumer Product Safety Risk Management System and National Electronic Injury Surveillance System databases identified 79 incidents, that, 79 fatal incidents that were associated with infant support cushions and involved infants up to 12 months of age. Nearly all the reported fatalities involved infants six months old or younger, and over three quarters involved infants three months old and younger. And nearly two thirds of all fatal incidents, the cause of death was determined to be asphyxia related. In about 40% of the fatal incidents, the infant support cushion was placed in an infant product such as a bassinet, crib, or play yard. In nearly half the fatal incidents, the bed, the infant support cushion was placed in an adult bed, on a couch or a futon, in a toddler bed, or on an air mattress. In 5% of the fatal incidents, the infant support cushion was placed on the floor or a mat. And finally, in 5% of the fatal incidents, the placement of the infant support cushion was undetermined or unknown. Uh, next slide, please. The major hazards, hazard patterns identified with staff in the analysis of the fatal incidents were the following. The use of the infant support cushion as an in-bed sleeper to facilitate bed sharing. Placement of the infant and our movement of the infant within the infant support cushion, resulting in inclusion of the nose and mouth while remaining in the product. And the infant rolling off the infant support cushion into a hazardous setting. Next slide, please. Although reported fatalities are staff's primary concern, staff also searched for non fatal incidents associated with infant support cushions to identify other possible risks of injury. Staff identified 125 non fatal incidents and consumer concerns associated with infant support cushions. About a quarter of the non fatal incidents are due to falls from the infant support cushion that was placed on elevated surface, such as an adult bed, bath and kitchen counters, chairs, and couches. Another quarter of these incidents were the result of the infant being found in a vulnerable position and rescued for a potentially asphyxiating environment. 14 of the non fatal incidents reported a rash while using the infant support cushion, and there was one report each for limb entrapment, mold, choking, near strangulation, and vomiting. A majority of the non fatal incidents, 38%, were consumer concerns. Based on this incident data, staff identified falls and threatened asphyxia as two major non-fatal hazards associated with infant support cushions. Next slide, please. Currently, there are no published voluntary standards for infant support cushions. In December 2021, staff requested ASCM to form a working group under F15 to develop a voluntary standard containing performance requirements to reduce the risk of death and injury from hazards associated with infant support cushions. ASTM formed two subcommittees under F15. F15.16 for infant feeding supports, which the commission has already been briefed on earlier this year, and F15.21 infant loungers. At the May 2023 F15.21 subcommittee meeting, a draft of the infant lounger standard was discussed, but so far, a draft of the standard has not been validated. CPSC staff has been actively participating in task groups for infant loungers that cover the scope, warnings, data analysis, and performance requirements. In August of this year, CPSC sent a letter to the performance task group to present our ideas on side height requirements and, uh, that were considered in the ASCM draft lander standard. Next slide, please. 
the scope of the AST, the scope of the draft AST and lounger standard includes less products that are covered by the scope of this infant support cushion rule. ASDM describes loungers as products with a raised perimeter, a recess, or other area that is intended to be placed on the floor and to provide a place for the infant to sit, lie, recline, or rest while supervised by an adult. They are not intended or marketed for sleep. Currently, the ASDM's draft proposed rule for loungers includes requirements for side height, stability, infant restraints, occupant support surface firmness, sidewall firmness, and marketing, labeling, instructional literature. To be clear, the AST standard for loungers, which focuses on less products than, proposed, than the proposed rule for infant support cushions, is still in draft form and has not been completed the full census process to be an approved standard. Therefore, the draft language is subject to change. Next slide, please. Staff considered the scope and definition of the proposed rule based on the existing pillow van, the infant support cushion market, and incident data. The draft proposed rule defines the infant support cushion as the infant product that is filled with or comprised of resilient material, such as foam, fibrous batting, or granule material, or with a gel, liquid, or gas, and which is marketed, designed, or intended to support an infant's weight or any portion of infant while reclining, while reclining or in a supine, prone, or recondite position. This includes, but is not limited to infant positioners, nursing products used for lounging, infant loungers, and infant props or cushions used to support an infant. This does not include products regulated by other CPSC durable infant and toddler product standards. Next slide, please. The past proposed rule for infant support cushions includes general requirements found in standards for similar products, such as a draft ASTM lounger standard and the nursing pillow missing pillow proposed rule presented to the commission in September of this year. The infant support cushion rule includes requirements for lead and paints, small parts, hazardous sharp edges or points, resistance to collapse, scissoring, shearing, and pinching, protective components, toy accessories, and a permanency of labeling, labels and warnings, which is consistent with the nursing pillow proposed rule, and that includes an additional warning permanency requirement that would address free hanging labels so the important warnings are not easily torn off. Next slide, please. In the proposed rule, staff is requiring firmness requirements for the occupant support surface, sidewall, and the intersection of the occupant support firmness and the sidewall. These requirements are adapted from the CPSC contractor report and uses a three inch hemispheric probe that was developed by the contractor. CPSC staff determined that the dimensions of the three inch hemispheric, hemispherical probe developed by the contractor are consistent with the size and shape of an infant's head. In addition, it can be easily applied to different types and sizes of surface areas that could be present in the variety of products that fall under the scope of this rule. For the occupant support surface firmness requirement, staff recommends applying the probe to an area of maximum thickness and at another location most likely to fail. At these locations, the probe is used to displace, the, is displaced in the vertical direction, the product surface by one inch. The force that is needed to displace the one inch must be greater than 10 newtons. This displacement force is comparable to the displacement force required for crib mattresses. For the sidewall firmness and the intersection of the sidewall and occupant support surface, the same test method is used, but is applied to these different uh, locations. Essentially, it is the attention of these requirements that any surface that an infant could potentially come in contact with while using the infant support cushion should be firm as a crib mattress. Next slide, please. Okay, this video that I'm about to show has, shows how staff applies the probe to the occupant support surface of the infant support cushion. Please play the video. Using the three inch hemispheric probe, Staff will lower the probe onto the occupant support surface one inch and measure the force. Thank you. Next slide, please. Great, thank you. Both the infant sleep product rule and the draft ASTM lounger standard have a maximum incline angle requirement to reduce the potential for positional asphyxia hazards. And these rules, the maximum incline angle of the product's occupant support surface cannot exceed 10 degrees when measured using a hinge weight gauge. 
Based on the incident data, staff determined that it was appropriate for infant support cushions to have a maximum incline angle requirement. However, due to the variety of products that fall under the scope of the infant support cushion rule, staff has developed a few modifications in the maximum incline angle test. The most significant modification is what surfaces are considered when determining the maximum incline angle. The infant support cushion rule, in the infant support cushion rule, the maximum incline angle test is measured from the highest surface that can support an infant, including size, to the lowest surface that can support an infant, including the floor or the surface that the product is placed on. Next slide, please. The following video shows staff conducting the maximum incline angle test for two different infant support cushions. The first video shows a product that has a maximum incline angle greater than 10 degrees when measured from the occupant support surface to the highest surface of the product. Um, please start this video on the, on the left. Yes. Staff positions the hinge wage gauge within the product so the top edge of the head torso portion of the gauge coincide with the plumb line, the outermost edge of the highest surface of the product. And the lower portion of the gauge rests on the occupant support surface. Then staff places a digital protractor with an accuracy plus minus one degree on the, head, on the angled head torso portion and measures the angle as so. Since this product has a maximum incline angle greater than 10 degrees between the occupant support surface and the highest surface there was, there's no need to test the maximum incline angle from the surface the product was placed on to another surface on the product. The next video shows a different product where, the, where due to the product size, it was necessary to measure the maximum incline angle from the support surface the product was placed on to the highest surface of the product. Please start the video on the right. The edge head torso portion of the hinge gauge was positioned on the highest surface of the product and the lower portion of the hinge gauge was placed on the surface supporting the product. The staff then places the digital protractor on the angle head torso, head, tor head torso portion and measures the angle as so. The maximum incline of this an incline angle of this product was from the supporting surface to the highest surface was less than 10 degrees. Next slide please. Uh, okay. Uh, due to the geometry of the newborn hinge gauge and the methodology of measuring the maximum incline angle, the height measured from the lowest surface to the highest surface of the infant support, the infant support cushion will be limited to two inches or less. Interestingly, as staff was developing the, the test for the method for the maximum incline angle test and measuring the incline angles of a range of different infant support cushion products, staff observed that products that pass the maximum incline angle test had uh, have, having inclines less than 10 degrees were less likely to appear to contain the infant and compares to products that fail the maximum incline angle test by having angles greater than 10 degrees, those products appear to be more likely to contain the infant. Next slide, please. To address potential entrapment hazards at the intersection of the sidewall and the occupant support surface, staff recommends a sidewall angle requirement that uses the hemispheric probe to determine the angle of this interface, which would be greater than 90 degrees. Staff has also included in this proposed rule requirements for restraints, seam strength, removal of components, and bounded openings. Next slide, please. The infant support cushion draft proposed rule includes warning label and instruction instructional requirements. These requirements have been developed based on incident data and recommendations issued from the American Academy of Pediatrics, the FDA, and CPSC. The American Academy of Pediatrics, the FDA, and CPSC have consistently warned against the use of pillows and soft bedding in an infant sleep environment and urged consumers to only use these products on the floor and stay near the infant while in use. The warning labels are also required to be conspicuous and permanent. Next slide, please. There are more than 2,000 suppliers of infant support cushions to the U.S. market. Most are small businesses. The draft proposed rule is expected to have a significant impact on a substantial number of small entities because currently there are no mandatory or voluntary performance standards for infant support cushions. Also, the proposed requirements would be new and most likely require redesign for any small business in the market. Therefore, staff recommend, recommends an effective date of 180 days. Next slide, please. 
But based on what I presented here, it is staff's pros staff recommendation to publish a notice of proposed rulemaking with staff's draft proposed rule for infant support cushions with an effective date of 180 days following the publication of the final rule. Thank you, and I welcome your questions at this time. Thank you. At this point in time, we're going to turn to questions from the commissioners. And once again, thank you uh, as well as your teams for continuing to focus on um, proving the safety of infant products. They are the most vulnerable among us and really need to be a priority for the, the agency. So I appreciate all of your works and all of those behind you as well. Um, given the staff's concern about infant support cushions being used for sleep and you know, being present in infant sleep environments, um, and as you mentioned, started with uh, sort of the pillow ban. Why did the staff uh, propose a, st a performance standard at this point in time? What's the uh, thinking behind the the um, the approach? Um, it um, it's staff's determination that the most effective and fastest way to address the hazards associated with infant support cushions was to go the 104 rule route. This allowed us to develop. A strong and broad uh, rule that supported our findings from the infant data review. And also, consumers um, find um, infant support cushions helpful for allowing their infants to relax for brief periods of time. And the performance requirements that we developed for the rule address the hazards that we saw with the infant data. So. Uh, cushion meeting this standard would, in, in effect, be a less hazardous place to put uh, infants on by while still being useful to parents. Yes, that's correct. Um, I may have other questions, but I'd like love to hear from my colleagues. So I'm going to start with Commissioner Feldman. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, Dr. Marcus and uh, Ms. Layton. Thank you very much for your work on. Uh, uh, this proposal and, and for the presentation today, I, I appreciate it. Um, I have a number of questions. I'm hoping to get to as many of them as I can in this. Uh, uh, but if we go over, I, I may want to request a second round. Um, but to, to start off, we're a data based agency and I'm, I'm taking a look at the incident data that you guys provided um, primarily on slides 8 and 9 um, on slide 8. Staff list 79 fatal incidents that we're aware of. Uh, are we relying on all of these incidents for a proposed rule? Uh, a significant proportion uh, portion of the fatalities that 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 were listed appear to be uh, contributed attributed to something other than um, suffocation or asphyxia, which I understand is the hazard that this proposed rule would seek to prevent. Um, another significant portion of these fatalities appear to involve other hazardous settings beyond the. Um, the, the infant cushion itself, and I, I would presume another uh, that, that a number of these incidents would involve co-sleeping or proximity to blankets, toys, other items that that aren't recommended for a safe sleep environment. So, is staff relying on these seventy nine uh, IDIs as, as the basis for uh, uh, the recommendation for uh, it, its determination, or is it is it discounting some of the seventy nine? I would say. Um... We relied on the 79 incidents. The three major hazard patterns that we outlined that facilitate bed sharing, the with movement within the, the infant support cushion, and the movement out of the infant support cushion into a hazardous setting, that's all, that's all indicated in the incidents. And all the incidents that show that were considered when developing those hazard patterns. Those hazard patterns are what we directly try to address with the performance requirements. And I think that uh, the staff concluded that the performance requirements do address those hazard patterns. Okay. On, the incident. on page 10, um, you wrote that 40 uh, of the slide deck, you wrote that that 40%, 7% of the non-fatal incidents were uh, due to consumer concerns. I, I don't know what that means. Can you explain what you mean by consumer concerns? Um, sometimes it will be the consumer will write in or will report to us that they that the product they they thought maybe they saw a recall product and they have the recall. I'm product. sorry. Sometimes the consumer will report that they have a they've seen a recall and they will report that they uh, they have a recall product they don't know what to do or they think that the product um, they weren't sure how to use the product. It's, they're just basically concerns that consumers will write in uh, report to us. Um, that don't really are not really have any injuries, um, but just mostly based on work we're, and we're counting those as incidents. Uh, we're, we're counting them as consumer reports. It's a consumer. It's an incident report. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay. But that's that was in the non-fatal incidents. So and that was we 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 can we didn't consider that with the developing the hazard patterns or the uh, with the two hazard patterns that were discovered in the non-fatal incidents or the threat and asphyxia and the falls. Okay. And none of the consumer concerns really address those issues. I understand. Um, on sidewall height. Uh, we, we know that almost 20% of the incidents here involve that hazard pattern that, that you discussed where uh, an infant rolled off the product into a hazardous setting, be it toe sleeping or, you know, within a crib or a bassinet or something like that. Um, yet what what I understand staff is proposing is a, a limit on the sidewall height that presumably could be justified by, you know, for example, discouraging caregivers from uh, believing that these products are are safe for unintended infants. Um, are there any human factor data that we're relying on um, or, or other information that, that that staff is relying on to suggest that a lower sidewall height would actually discourage caregivers in this way? And, and if not, uh, do we run the risk of, of exacerbating both the, the, the roll off into a more hazardous I environment pattern as well as um, the risk of fall? The sidewall height is something that we're open to comments on. We we discovered, we concluded that the sidewall height, the, that maximum incline angle, which we're really concerned about with positional asphyxia incidents, limited the sidewall height or the potential sidewall height to two inches. And as I said, we observed with those, those products that the sidewall height did not give the impression or that the products could be containing the infant. This is one of the major hazard patterns that we've seen with the data is that this, this issue that consumers seem to have the, the impression that these products can contain the infant. And we, uh, we concluded that that does contribute to a lot of the hazards associated with the infant's support cushions. Okay. And, and that conclusion, I, I guess, is what I'm asking uh, about. Is that supported by human factors or, or any other data that, that sidewall height has any sort of positive relationship with uh, that conclusion or the belief by parents and caregivers that um, that the products, in fact, are, are, are safe for unattended infants, or is that just a supposition that we're making? Um, I would have to ask my team member from Human Factors to more to, to give you a better answer on that. But okay. my understanding is that when we discuss sidewall height and we're going through the issues, that there is no clear literature uh, data on the impression the sidewall height and the impression of containment with consumers. Okay. It looks like you've got co-counsel. Celestine's ready to go. Uh, I'm Celestine Kish from the Division of Human Factors. And it was more a matter of uh, the comments we received about consumers using the product because they, with the larger sidewalls, because they had the sidewalls, they, the consumers were saying, my baby fit in there and could stay in there. So then the, lower sidewalls, they won't have that same impression. Okay. Okay, that, that's helpful. Thank you. Th thank you for that. Um, on the maximum incline angle of, of, of 10 degrees, that, that seems to be one of the key features of, of the proposal here. H how did staff come up with the, 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 the recommendation of 10 degrees as the maximum incline angle? Is that based on the, um, for example, the the University of uh, Arkansas 2019 study that we've relied on elsewhere, or, or is that from something else? It's based on the uh, other schools with the maximum incline angle uh, for infant for the infant sleep product rule. That. So that we're it's the the 10 degrees that we're relying on here is based on the the 10 degrees that we used in the the ISR. If I understand correctly, that ISR was was based on the the 2019 Manon study. So. So, so that's the the, um, the 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 underlying study and research that we would be relying on for the ten degrees here. Yes. Okay. Um, on the test probe, staff's uh, draft proposal uh, includes an occupant support force firmness test and obviously a, a test in the sidewall. And you explained that, and, and thank you for that. Um, but it, it involved the, a, a test probe and a method that I understand were developed by the researchers at, at, at BSU. Um, I just want to get a better sense of what that test would look like should CPSC move to finalize the rule. Um, and, and whether BSU or any of the study authors um, own 
patents or other IP in either the, the probe itself or the, the test method? And if so, whether staffs received assurances that, um, that, that the, the, uh, any relevant IP holders would, would license that to uh, labs and others at, at, on sort of fair and reasonable terms? Um, that I'm, I'm not aware of, and maybe someone more capable would be able to answer that. I don't think that be. You've got co-counsel. They did not describe. You have the... Yeah, the, Mr. The, Boniface. The, yeah. the test probe is, uh, and apparatus are the same ones we're using in other rules in that there are no, uh, uh, there are, uh, there are a variety of, uh, Probes that can be used to meet the requirements. Okay. The apparatus itself is uh, is already out in uh, in use. And, and what about the method? Is is that something that would be sort of freely I accessible to to anybody that would want to use that method to test? Yes. Among okay. other among other things, we we sponsored that research, so it's uh, paid for by the government. And, okay. Uh, Great. Um, I I do have additional questions, but I, I don't. I want to be mindful of the time. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate the, the responses. Commissioner Trumka. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you for the presentation and thank you for everyone and, and all of you here in the room that contributed to this rule. This is fantastic. I mean, this is a really fantastic proposal. You look at this problem logically, you hit it from every angle, it, you approached it thoroughly. And, and as Ms. Kish came up and reminded us, you know, we have experts and we lend expertise and we, we rely on statistical analysis. We can also use common sense sometimes, and and you did all of those in in this instance. So thank you. Um, as we look into the death data, you know I I see that we've identified seventy nine incidents since twenty ten, and what I'm you know kind of most fixated on right now is that forty percent of those are in just the last two years for which we have data. So in twenty. You know, we've had 17 deaths in 2020. We have at least 17 deaths in 2021, and you've indicated that number could grow as more data comes in. So this looks like a growing trend, and that's concerning, and that's why I'm glad we're here talking about it today. Um, so my question is, when we look at those, and, and when we look at the potential solution that you've proposed, what percentage of these do you think we can prevent if this if this rule goes into effect? Um. Great question. I mean, the hope is that all of them, um, but um, we we think that the performance requirements that we've uh, developed in this rule address. It's as it, Duffy said, it's all based on the incident review, yeah. and we are we're very determined to make sure that all the hazards that we identified through the incident review were addressed in these performance requirements. Yeah. So. It would be the goal that all of them would be addressed. Um, you know, I thought that was going to be the answer when I read this package. Yeah. I'm so happy to hear it. I know we don't like to speak in absolutes, yeah. but but to know that that's the goal, and and it was clear when I read this package that's the goal. So yes, again, thank you. Um, you know, so so you indicated a lot of these deaths are happening on soft surfaces when these when these products are placed on a bed or on a couch or or any other soft surface. And, and the only other question I had is on the testing. So on the occupant support surface firmness testing, um, which seemed great, by the way, I like the number of test points we're using on that as well. Um, but the question is, the, the sample size that we looked at, only one seemed to pass that, and it had a thin fabric-based, you know, it was less than an inch. You could understand why it would test when it was placed on a firm, flat surface. Have we given consideration to the fact that these might not always be used on those firm flat surfaces and testing on maybe a soft surface? Would it would it perform the same that test on a softer surface? Um, I guess there would would be differences. We had we have not put that in the, the proposal. We're open to comments on that, but um, I know the testing to be done is usually on a support surface. Yeah. Um, but that's something. That would definitely would be something to get comments on some testing labs to right. use how these products that be used. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that might be one where it's a little bit difficult to define the soft surface we put it on. But but if we think through that issue and we realize that that's going to be the scenario that's the hazard scenario in real life, if we could figure out a way to account for it, that might be great. But but again, I mean, I'm nitpicking at this point because this rule is fantastic uh, in terms of this proposal you've put forward. So thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Wall. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Dr. Marquez, uh, for this work and for all the other uh, staff members who I know have been working on this quite some time. Uh, I do appreciate it very much. Just to go back to the um, discussion of the 40% of the fatalities in 2020 and 2021, uh, to what do you attribute uh, that spike, if if you know? Um, the increase in the recent years. Correct. Um, I honestly don't know how to respond to that. Um, there has been an increase in the deaths um, the, in the recent years. Um, I think these products are more out in the market. Um, and I think that um, the just the, I, I, I'm really not sure how to answer that question. I'm sorry. Okay, that's I, okay. I, I, we may not know, um, I would, I just, but it is no, it was it's, remarkable it's, it's, to see that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. I appreciate that. Um, again, sticking with the data for a minute, uh, I think 80% of the fatalities associated with the products involve infants three months and younger. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, are you aware of any of and that's consistent, I think, with what we heard recently on rockers, where a large percent of the incidents were involved in that age cohort. Is there any commentary you would share on literature or infant development that you would um, suggest explains why there's a, a cluster of incidents in that age group? That age group seems to be the most vulnerable age group as far as in, in sleep environments, especially. Is the net age group between the two and six month age range? Infants often can find themselves they can they can do movements such as flipping over it, but not be able to to be able to go back. And that is the age where they are able to do certain things and not be able to self rescue as easily. They don't have the motor skills to self rescue if they find themselves inadvertently flipped over doing it for the first time, and then they can't do it back, and then they find themselves in a hazardous uh, environment. Um, that's also when their their head to body ratio is heaviest, and so they tend to have um, heavier heads to to lead them to more um, face down situations. Okay, given that, um, uh, have you given thought to a specific warning for that age cohort on these products or any of the type of products that we talk about in the under the one hundred four rubric? Well, I. I um... I we're open to comments on that too. I think that the the, age, the intended age range for the products tend to be under one year, so the the warnings would be um, would be kind of restricted to that age range, at least that one year range range. Right. Further, yes. Right. But I took what you're saying and what the data seems to be suggesting that even with the, you know there's a broad range in that zero to twelve, and that maybe we're really even focusing more uh, on that zero to three, zero to four. Um, uh, that is something we could consider, you know, comments on and consider. Yes, I, you know, in that same vein, in terms of warnings, um, I think in the OS um, on page OS 104, the health sciences memo, it states that premature infants and infants who are born as a set of multiples are particularly vulnerable and are at the highest risk, primarily due to physical inability and an immature physiological system. Again, I know we. We, uh, I believe, put uh, warnings in the proposed rule and rockers uh, for this um, uh, cohort, and I wonder if you thought about that in this instance. Um, we have not thought about it to put it in the, the proposed rule as it stands now, but we definitely will have uh, something to consider in the, in the future and comments on yes. Okay, so thank something. you. Sorry. No problem. No. Great, thank you. Uh, I appreciate that very much. And just one last question, and I know you talked about it in your slides, but could you please explain again the difference between the AS, how ASTM defines infant lounger and how we're defining it in the proposed rule? Um, so yeah, ASTM, uh, they basically define the infant lounger um, as a product with a raised perimeter they um, and a recess or other area that's intended uh, to be placed on the floor and to place a place for the infant to sit, lie, recline, or rest while supervised by an adult. So our product rule basically, our rule uh, basically says that it's a, it's a product that's filled with a uh, fibrous uh, batting or resilient material um, that is intended to support the infant during uh, periods of uh, to reply to the lie recumbent, recline, prone, or supine. 
So it, the big difference is the idea of the, I think the raised perimeter that the loungers incorporates in their definition versus our definition for infant support cushions where we're saying it is just a, they're supporting. They don't have the, uh, the perimeter issue. Okay. That's clear. Thank you. I appreciate that. I don't have any more questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you again very much. There has been a request for a second round, so Commissioner Feldman. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll try to be brief. Um, following up on uh, uh, the question that that my colleague uh, Commissioner Boyle asked with respect to um, that that 2020 to 2021 spike that we saw, which you know, based on the the the, uh, the 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 histogram that you put forward, uh, uh, I think told the story. Um, where it was almost a, a, a doubling, but you, you mentioned that uh, that that it may have to do with the number of products in the marketplace. Has staff um, uh, been able to normalize the incident data based on uh, and to control for the number of products in the marketplace? And if so, is that trend that that we saw does that persist? Um. I don't think that we've done that. I, mean, um, I have to get back to you for it. Okay, uh, if we could, I think that yeah, that would be useful. Um, with respect to durable products, this Ms. Layton, this is probably a question for you. Um, staff is proposing that we proceed with the rule under section 104, uh, which applies as we all know to durable infant and nursery products. Um, can you please explain uh, how staff is defining durable in this context? And I'm not looking for a legal interpretation. Oh, okay. Uh, um, as, as explained uh, in the notice, uh, these products are considered durable because they're often used for more than one infant, um, more than one child, uh, either later children the same family sure. that, that initially purchased the product or sometimes they're sold on the secondary market as used products. Um, so for those reasons, they, so they can be used for several years. Okay. So the, 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 the definition here is sort of limited to, to products that can be resold or reused. Uh, I'm not saying I, I'm not I, saying that's, I don't I don't want to get into I'm not saying that's the limit of the definition, okay. but I'm saying that's an indication that staff has pointed to uh, to reflect the durability. Of okay, because we do see a number of things that can be resold uh, and, and, and reused, including clothing that I, I don't think that we uh, would would consider um, to be durable per se. But but so th that's not the only indicia that we're looking at. No, and I, if you, if uh, the commissioner would like to get into a, a discussion of the legal definition of durability, that would need to be in a closed session, I believe. Okay. Uh, on product substitution, thank you, thank you. Uh, on product substitution, so to the extent that the proposed rule would render a, a significant portion of these products uh, uh, useless and, and that staff predicts that a, a number of firms would exit the marketplace altogether, uh, what, if anything, do we anticipate in terms of user substitution here? This is a, an issue that's been raised in the context of uh, other infant and toddler products that we've dealt with recently. Do we expect parents and caregivers to substitute with products that, that are known uh, to be safer? Or can we rule out regrettable substitutions like blankets and pillows and, 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 and things like that that may, in fact, be less safe? Um. Well, the, the, the intention that, um, that these products that they'll be still be able to use these products and just in a safer way, they will be safer, um, products. Than less hazards, just the, um, they're, they're more firm and they're less able to contain the infant. Um, I, I'm not sure how to answer the question. Can, um. Yeah, so I, I think it's safe to say that we cannot rule out uh, regrettable substitution. Parents are going to do a, a, a variety of different things. I think, as uh, Dr. Marquez notes, what we're looking to try to do is for these products that are marketed for infant use, 
uh, for uh, relaxation and so forth. We're trying to make them safer. So the hope, the intent is to uh, ensure that they are, in fact, safe for those advertised purposes. Okay. With respect to the substitution issue writ large, is this something that Human Factors has studied, and will it share its findings on the record? I think we'll have to get back to you. I don't know that it's explored in this package, but we'll look back to see if there's other materials. Okay. I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Um, last question, I, I think. Um, so I, I do understand that uh, uh, it, you got into this when with the discussion of uh, uh, the, the small business impact, uh, but I, I do understand that a significant portion of the producers in this marketplace um, fall into the category, not just of small businesses, but but are more of the sort of home crafters and, and, and DIY hobbyist uh, portion of, of that particular market. Um, should the commission finalize this rule, uh, you know, will it apply to these home-based businesses? And if so, can you discuss a little bit about how the commission attends, intends to address this segment of the marketplace? Um, maybe our economists can address that, yes. Uh, good morning. Um, so the market is largely, uh, there are a lot of home crafters um, selling. And um, we, as stated in the our IRFA, we do expect that'll be a, sec a sig significant impact to them. Uh, but we want to receive comments on exactly how it, it would impact them. As, you, as, as there's a lot of home crafters, it's a very opaque market. So we're asking for comments for more information about exactly how it, it, would, it would impact them. Okay. Um when it comes to the testing requirements that we're ordering, what we're putting in place, are, are we aware of test labs that that te work with home-based businesses and sort of cater to uh, these sort of specialty small batch DIY producers? I can help with that. I, I think we actually crossed that Rubicon uh, with the um, uh, infant sling carries rule, where we had that that same sort of. Uh, 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 working with the the micro producers and them having to then start work with the lab so i think that they're more familiar uh, with that process than uh than in the past okay i'm glad to hear that we're we're, we're asking comments for this I, I i think that there is some opacity here that that uh uh makes sense and in addition to understanding the impact on on this segment of, of small businesses uh, obviously, it also poses, uh, I, I would posit, some some very serious enforcement challenges, um, just given how diffuse that market market is. But uh, I think those are exactly the types of things that uh, that that I in particular would would look forward to hearing comments on. So, again, I, I thank you all for answering the questions uh, and, and for your work, uh, not only on the presentation today, uh, but the, the the package and the proposal itself. So, thank you very much, Mr. Trumka. Thank you. Um, you, you got some questions on substitution here and, and i think the way i look at it when we look at the death numbers in this product this is the regrettable substitute for a safe sleep space and you're making this safer so i don't think that's a thing we need to worry about here uh, and as we continue to clear the various segments of other unsafe sleep surfaces i mean that's the goal uh, and and get people back in cribs bassinets firm flat surfaces is the goal so getting rid of these Regrettable substitutes is what you're talking about today. Thank you. Commissioner Wall. I don't have any additional questions, just to thank you again for your work. I appreciate it. And I add my thanks as well uh, for both the informative briefing and for the work that you've been doing in you know over the past years on this. Um, and also to thanks to the commissioners for the active participation and thanks to the Office of the Secretary, as well as facilities, communications for their assistance in this briefing. Um, there's not been a request for a closed session. So with that, we are adjourned.